right, hello everyone, and welcome back to Keyshot World 2021. I am Derek Cicero. Uh, I'm your host. I'm the Vice President of Products here at Luxion. Um, hope you've been having a really fun time these last couple of days here. Uh, got one more day for you. Uh, for folks that visit our website already today, wanted to let you know, you probably saw it, KeyVR 10.2 is out now, released this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about that today in one of the sessions, actually in the first session of the, of the day. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, VR and what we're doing in VR, definitely hang around for that. You can definitely grab a trial as well. We'll be talking about that. Um, a lot a lot of cool stuff going on. Also released 10.2 about two weeks ago. We we'll talked about some new features there as well. So definitely a good uh, day to get updated on what we're doing here at Luxion. Um, so in case you missed, we had some great presentations the last couple of days. Uh, yesterday, some fantastic ones. First up, we had Brad Edelman and Tim Fair from Keyshot Studios. They stopped by to talk about the concept of the digital twin uh, and how they use that basically to really amplify uh, and get maximum value for their clients uh, using Keyshot. Uh, one of the things that came up in that conversation is this concept of digital twin, people kind of hearing the term, not knowing what it means. And really, it's the concept of you know taking the, the CAD data, bringing in the Keyshot, formulating all the different ways, the material ways, the color ways, all the, the configurations, the model sets, and building a true uh, you know, twin, a virtual twin that can be used across the board from sales, marketing, all the assets you need to generate outside of that. So uh, definitely a really interesting presentation. Definitely check that out if you did if you missed it yesterday. Um, we then had Matt Hainsley from Bucktail Design come in. He talked about packaging with Keyshot. He's worked at, at Hasbro, Peloton, GoPro. He talked about his experience Experience uh, from you know shrink wrap plastic all the way to sustainable uh, paper materials. So if you're someone who's interested in packaging and how you can use Keyshot in packaging design, I recommend that one as well. Uh, we finished up with Frank Tineski from Kids Two. He talked about how because of COVID they had to have their entire uh, manufacturing process really get virtualized and digitized, and sort of how that that was a forcing function for them. Uh, some of the ROI value they got from that. So if you're kind of listening, in, interested in for the more of the, the business case of Keyshot, I recommend that presentation as well. Uh, as a reminder, all of our sessions are on YouTube. All the ones that are, we're going to do today will also be on YouTube. And that's really just my way of saying, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's fantastic and, and you should you should do it because it's got great, great content on there. Um, we had a cool giveaway yesterday. We gave away a GoPro on Tuesday. Yesterday, we gave away a Keyshot 10 Pro Pro license to Mariana Sal, uh, Sal, Saldivar. Sorry, Mariana, um, but congratulations to you. Today, we are giving away an NVIDIA A6000 GPU. That's right, we're giving away a massive GPU. Uh, if you attend any of the three sessions, you're basically entered to win. Uh, by coming in, we'll grab your email, we'll pick someone out of a hat, uh, not an actual hat, it'll be a virtual hat, of course, uh, and then we'll follow up with you. But you definitely wanna check all three sessions because one, great content, two, win GPU, pretty sweet deal. Um, wanna give a quick plug to LinkedIn. I uh, talked about our YouTube, talked about our Instagram. Uh, our LinkedIn, it's uh, Luxion Makers of Keyshot on LinkedIn. It's a great way to network with people out there who are doing cool stuff in Keyshot. We get a lot of great customer stories. Uh, the cool things that you're doing, the ways that you're exploring design with Keyshot. If you have a cool story, post it on LinkedIn, we'll share it. We love to tell those kind of stories. So please join us uh, on LinkedIn if you have not already done so. So getting to today, as I mentioned, uh, the last day, sessions again at 10 noon and 2 p.m. Pacific time. First up, we've got Kareem Merchant, our own Kareem Merchant, creative specialist here uh, at Luxion, joined with Colton uh, Melhoff from Stratasys. So it's a bit of a dream team. Uh, and they're gonna talk about collaborative design. Uh, I mentioned key VR, I mentioned 10.2. A lot of the features that we've been pushing, obviously with everything going on uh, recently is really how people can collaborate more easily. Uh, we put a lot of uh, effort into 3MF, for example, to make it easier to do 3D print with things like Stratasys. So they're gonna talk about all the ways uh, that we've implemented that and how you can utilize that in your design decision-making. So big thank you to Colton from Stratasys for joining us here today. Um, after that, we've got uh, Michael Pavlovich from Certain Affinity. He's been talking about ZBrush with Keyshot. So really interesting in terms of uh, game design, character design, how he uses that. And then we're wrapping it all up with the fellows from Offshoot, uh, Tyler Anderson uh, and Jack Marple. And then we're we'll talking about product shots in Keyshot and really how to make those really eye-catching product shots. So it's gonna be a really nice finish to our day. Um, reminder uh, to engage on social media, uh, hashtag Keyshot World. Like I said, if you get inspired to see cool stuff, please post it. We will have a Q&A um, at the end of each session. So if you have questions, 
You can ask them in the Q&A. We have folks uh, on hand to answer them and we'll save some of the really um, uh, interesting questions uh, to ask Colton, Kareem, uh, and all the presenters at the end. So like I said, I hope you're having a great time. I hope you're enjoying the content. Um, and with no further ado, Kareem, take it away. All right, can you uh, see me clearly and hear me clearly over there? I can. All right, good morning. What's going on, everyone? Hope you're all doing well out there and thanks for tuning in to our first session of the day. My name is Kareem Merchant. I'm one of our creative specialists here at Luxion based out of our Orange County, California headquarters. And today I'm going to be giving you a rundown of some of our great new features and updates, as well as taking a look at some of the ways Keyshot can make creative collaboration easier than it's ever been. A little bit about myself. I'm an industrial design and product design grad from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Since graduating, I've worked as a freelance industrial designer. I've created products and strategies across several industries. And most recently, I've worked as a creative specialist here at Luxion. In my current role, my goal is to create compelling content that both teaches and empowers users just like you to create and take your concept visualization to the next level. With that said, I'd like to quickly plug some of our available resources. If you're interested in diving deeper into Keyshot, we have our Keyshot 3D YouTube channel. Here you'll find quick tips and tutorials of all our latest features that cater to both brand new Keyshot users as well as seasoned veterans. We also have several social media platforms where you can get updates on our latest events and releases, as well as see incredible work from creators all over the world. We have the Keyshot form as well, which is a great resource for posting work and getting feedback from the Keyshot community. And you can find all those resources along the bottom of this slide. And while I'm on the subject of plugging resources, many of the helmet images and VR stills you're gonna see through the presentation are from our Envoy Helmet project that we recently put together. I know it's been mentioned a few times through Keyshot World, but it's a great resource to check out how Keyshot can play a role in the overall design process from start to finish. Uh, if you're interested in checking it out, visit our project page at www.keyshot.com slash envoy, and you'll be able to not only get a look at our entire process, but you'll also be able to download sample scenes, AR files, and full color 3D printable 3MF files. And if at any point you happen to have questions you'd like to direct specifically to me, uh, you can reach out to me via email at kareem.merchantluxion.com. You can also reach out to our general info and uh, our uh, sales, or excuse me, our support team directly. Now, I know many of you are generally curious about the workstations we use here in the studio. We have a monster of a tower from Main Gear. It's running an AMD Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX with 32 cores. And currently, we have an NVIDIA RTX A6000 GPU on board, 128 gigs of RAM, and running Windows 10 Pro. It's definitely a monster of a machine. If you're in the market for a render machine, I would highly recommend dropping by Main Gear site and seeing what they have to offer. And I know it's been mentioned uh, over the last couple of days a few times, but not only do we have an RTX A6000 in our machine currently, thanks to NVIDIA, we also have another RTX A6000 that we'll be giving away at the end of this afternoon session. Definitely stick around for that. That is hands down something you do not want to miss. I can tell you from experience that working with this GPU, it, GPU is absolutely unreal. Um, rendering and animating with it is lightning fast and with 48 gigabytes of GPU memory, it will no doubt revolutionize your creative workflow. So do not miss out. And finally, let's get into the meat of this thing. Uh, here's a little overview of what I'm going to be talking about specifically in this session. Uh, I'll give you guys a quick look at some of our new features and updates in Keyshot 10.2. We'll take a look at the new release of KeyVR, which is live as of this morning. We'll talk about collaborative design using some of Keyshot smart exports, including 3MF, which I'll dive into a bit. And lastly, I'll pass it over to Colton Melhoff from Stratasys and let him give you guys a breakdown of what they're all about and the incredible things you can achieve using Stratasys 3D printers. And Colton will also be announcing our latest collaborative competition, so be sure to stick around for that. So what's new in 10.2? Keyshot 10.2 is packed with lots of updates and a few new features. The big ones we're going to take a quick look at are the mesh simplification tool, our new metallic flake controls for Exalta paints, a personal favorite of mine, and the split object surface paint selection tool. 
We'll also touch on some of the new GLB, GLTF changes in 10.2 and take a look at the USDZ exports once we get to the smart export portion of this presentation. So let's talk mesh simplification. What is it and why is it useful? Well, much like the retessellate tool in previous versions, mesh simplification has been implemented to help reduce the overall triangle count of a model in Keyshot. Essentially, the difference between retessellate and mesh simplification is that the former helps reduce triangle count for NURBS-based models, while the latter is specifically designed to work with mesh-based models. If you're looking to use either tool, you can find them both by selecting the tools icon on the ribbon at the top of the real-time view. When selected, you'll have a new window pop up that looks very similar to the split object surface tool window or the UV unwrap window, if you're familiar with either of those. And from there, you'll be able to make adjustments to your model's mesh quality. Uh, the tool slider will initially be set to one, which will match the current mesh quality as imported as a baseline. And from there, it can be reduced all the way down to 0 0.00001, which at that point, your model is going to look pretty low poly. So you're going to want to look for a happy medium that gives you a quality looking model with a low enough triangle count to get your desired performance. And you can also use the edit normal tool post mesh simplification to make the model appear a little less low poly inside of Keyshot. Now, this is a fun feature that I've been using often as of recently. If you're familiar with Exalta paints in previous versions, you're gonna love the addition of flake controls. One of the, uh, the biggest pain points I found with Exalta paints in previous versions was the lack of control over the embedded flake, specifically when you're rendering transportation related imagery. Luckily in 10.2, that is a thing of the past. With Keyshot's new Exalta UI, you can now access flake controls from the existing advanced accordion located just under the roughness slider. And from there, you'll be able to control two new parameters, flake size and flake density, which are both specified in millimeters. So it's very, very important to make sure any model you're using is imported at the correct real world scale, or you'll encounter discrepancies when you're trying to make adjustments to your flake. So to, to use this feature, you have two parameters and sliders that you can adjust. The first is the flake size, which can be adjusted from zero to 10 millimeters, and the flake density, which can be adjusted on a scale of zero to one. When put to use, the parameters will randomly distribute the metal flakes. Some flakes will appear brighter than others, and they'll automatically match your specular reflection and the color of your underlying Exalta material. And just a quick tip when you're using this feature, typically metallic flaked paint uh, uses flake sizes between 0 0.02 millimeters and 0 0.5. So creating renders with, uh, with those, that parameter set in this uh, kind of range will most closely mimic a real world finish. And this is also why I cannot emphasize enough how important proper scale is when you're using that feature. And on this slide, you can see an example of what the flake size range looks like on a vehicle model I recently worked on. Zero millimeters essentially creates a finish that is flake free, um, while 10 millimeters creates flake sizes that appear approximately a half inch in size on a properly scaled model. And the center example shows the flake at 0.1 millimeters in size. So you get an idea of kind of that broad range that you can achieve when you're actually working with a, a model inside of Keyshot. And on this example, you can see the typical flake size range I mentioned being illustrated. Uh, with the top half representing 0 0.02 millimeters, which is almost has non-existent flake, while the bottom half is sent to 0.5 millimeters, which would represent a real-world paint that is heavily flaked. Um, and I know sometimes it's a little difficult to take all this info in without actually seeing it in practice, so I highly recommend keeping your eyes on the lookout for our upcoming Exalta Paint Quick Tip, where I use this exact model to demo the new feature. That should be pretty helpful for you guys who are interested in it. All right, another great feature that's been added to 10.2 is the paint selection feature in the split object surfaces window. Uh, this feature essentially allows you to select complex compound surfaces by using a brush tool to actually paint on the parts of your model you want to select. It's really a useful tool that makes selecting surfaces much simpler. Uh, one thing to note, however, is that if a model needs to be rotated to paint another side of a surface, you do need to hold down both Alt and Shift while painting to ensure that it retains the previously selected portions of the model surface, much like shift clicking in, in many of the other programs. Uh, 
And uh, you can kind of get an idea of what that window and tool look like in action by looking at the example images on the right of the slide. The split object surfaces window that you're seeing at the top right of the slide represents the controls that are actually along the left column of the split object surface window. And the painted image demonstrates how that tool would work within the program. Uh, the painting function in general is super intuitive, uh, particularly if you're already familiar with uh, programs like Adobe software like Photoshop. So it's pretty easy to use. And some of the other great improvements in 10.2 include the ability to import GLTF files into Keyshot, as well as export them with Draco compression. We've also improved the way both USD and GLB GLTF files are imported into Keyshot. With the new improvements, textures and materials appear more accurate than previous imports. And I'll actually be showing you an example here in a minute of what that looks like. I'll also be going a little more in depth on USDZ and GLB GLTF when discussing collaborative design practices uh, with, with Keyshot exports. And uh, lastly, for our 10.2 editions, we've also introduced the link duplicate material tool, which allows users to easily locate and link materials in their scene that are the same. Uh, this basically works as an organizational tool and helps clean up some of that clutter that can sometimes be generated by a few specific functions. And finally, as illustrated by the Caustics King, David Murs on the right of the slide, we've also improved Caustics, making renders with heavy Caustics more realistic and more dynamic than ever. And we actually have a great blog article from one of our, our founders uh, about rendering Caustics with GPU. So if you guys are interested in learning more about the subject, you can visit the article I have listed on this slide and give it a quick read. That's the, the blue link at the bottom. Um, I'll also include a link to it in the YouTube description when I post the high-res version of this presentation later today. All right, okay, with all those great updates in 10.2 out of the way, let's uh, let's start by jumping into Keyshot's collaborative design features because in today's world, particularly because of COVID, we've all had to adapt to some form or another of remote communication. And the first thing we're going to discuss in relation to remote collaboration is our new release of KeyVR, which is officially live as of this morning. Uh, and with KeyVR 10.2, we've introduced our latest version that can be purchased separately from KeyShot. And this version is packed with some incredible features to help you preview how your projects might look at scale in real world settings. And included in those newly introduced features is KeyVR Connect. Uh, our new multi-user KeyVR interface that allows users to collaborate in real time from anywhere in the world. Uh, and along with that game-changing feature, we've also introduced some updates to our tools and processing. Uh, there's now a new measure tool that allows you to get measurements of scene elements in real time, a newly added move tool widget that lets you rearrange your virtual spaces. And we've also improved upon our material baking, load times, and performance updates for a generally more streamlined VR experience. So KeyVR Connect, which I mentioned a moment ago, is one of the biggest additions to the KeyVR tool bag. You know, using KeyVR Connect, you can now use KeyShot's powerful VR capabilities to create environments and sessions where multiple users can experience the same environment in real time. Uh, KeyVR, it not only allows you to connect locally, but also allows users to connect through VPN, which, you know, making, making communicating uh, uh, design concepts with global stakeholders uh, much easier and, and simpler to do. And being able to communicate in real time greatly reduces the chances that concepts and decision making will get misinterpreted. It also helps to speed up the process of receiving and implementing feedback. And if you look to the example on the right, you can see a screenshot from a video that we've created here at Luxion with our Envoy helmet design. Here you can see myself and two other members of our creative team collaborating in real time, discussing multiple colorway options and lens types, and getting a better understanding of how our product would live in its retail environment. All right, and although KeyVR is an incredibly powerful tool, there are some things you should keep in mind to make your KeyVR experience as streamlined as possible. And one, I would recommend consulting the manual to get a list of materials that are not compatible uh, with KeyVR. Uh, in general, this will make your material choices easier and it'll help you avoid discrepancies during live sessions. 
And another thing to consider is locking your model sets and parts within Keyshot, since it is possible to enable physics and move objects around. Uh, it's best to lock those parts or models that you wish to remain stationary, particularly during demo sessions or connect sessions, so they don't accidentally get moved around. And you also may notice on this image to the right, uh, you can see several instances where the Keyshot and Envoy logos have been applied to swag and apparel throughout the scene. Uh, you can even see examples of posters in the background and a sign indicating new arrivals. Unfortunately, in KeyVR, traditional labels are not supported unless baked. In order to achieve similar results without baking, uh, labels are going to need to be applied as diffuse layers so that they can be viewed in KeyVR without issue. And in regard to the previously mentioned unsupported materials, KeyVR does not support physical lighting, but it does support emissives. However, emissives don't actually produce projected light, so they typically work best to illustrate objects that produce light or to backlight elements in your scene. Um, you can actually uh, kind of get a look at what that looks like underneath the shirts that say Envoy in the back there. Um, but you're going to really want to rely on your HDRIs to light elements in your scene and to do the heavy lifting. You can also set up multiple lighting environments with your HDRIs in Keyshot that can then be selected through in KeyVR. Uh, it's great if your goal is to try to emphasize different elements or models within the environment. And you can also be used to show how a model or scene might appear during different times of the day. So it's definitely a, a useful tool. Also on the topic of collaborative design within Keyshot, let's talk about our two types of AR exports for viewing in augmented reality. And in 10.2, both USDZ and GLB GLTF have received some updates that have made them more streamlined and effective. Uh, in big news, GLTF is now importable the same way USDZ has been. USDZ has also received several material import updates that now help it retain high level detail and material information when importing USDZ files into Keyshot. I have them uh, listed on the slide for you to save, but USDZ files now import with a generic material and maintain roughness, metallic, and normal maps, as well as diffuse layers. This just generally makes for more accurate and realistic representations of your A file, AR files that are being imported in, back into Keyshot. Um, these updates also apply to GLB, GLTF files now that they have been added to the list of importable files as well. And you can see an example on this slide of how a GLB GLTF file looks in 10.2 versus 10.1. There's a clear level of difference in material realism and quality in the latest version. And although this sample is from a GLB GLTF file, it is representative of how a USDZ file will appear in 10.2 versus 10.1 as well. And just a, a quick note for anyone who might be confused about the difference between USDZ and GLTF. Essentially, they both serve the same function as an exported file that is viewable in augmented reality. However, USDZ is Apple iOS specific, while GLB GLTF was designed to be viewed on Android platforms. So hopefully that clears some of that up. So what are USDZ exports and how do they play a role in collaborative design? Essentially, USDZ is a zipped file type co-created by Apple and Pixar that was designed to export mesh, binary, and texture data to devices that support augmented reality viewing, in this case, Apple iOS-based devices. And as with all AR exports, the ability to quickly export concepts at all stages of the design process and have them viewed on a cell phone or a digital device anywhere in the world creates an incredible opportunity for stakeholders globally to participate in the creative process. Being able to discuss colorway options, design decisions, and even scale overlaid on a real world environment helps drive more effective decision making and makes sharing and viewing models as simple as turning on your phone, which is pretty incredible. And unlike KVR, you do not have the ability to work in a fully virtual environment in real time, but being able to send models via USDZ it allows you to reach development partners and stakeholders who may not have access to expensive equipment such as VR headsets or or powerful workstation. Uh, you know, this is it not only expedites the, the development process, but it also makes it easier to communicate with manufacturers as well about uh, specific design details or elements of the design that could be overlooked through typical forms of communication. 
Uh, and, and a note, USDZ is currently supported by Apple devices with iOS 12 and above. There is currently no native support on Android. However, I do encourage exploring third-party programs if USDZ viewing is a, a preference or a priority for you on Android. Now, if you are going to be using USDZ exports for your future projects, or you've already done so, but you want to learn how to better optimize them, I have a few tips for making USDZs work for you. Excuse me. Uh, the, the first thing to consider is accurate normals. Whether you have them situated correctly in your modeling software of choice, or you set your normals within Keyshot, it's incredibly important to have your normal set correctly, or you'll end up running into problems such as you know, missing surfaces or parts of your model that appear black. Uh, generally, having correct normals is always a necessity. However, they become doubly important when working with exports such as USDZ, GLB, GLTF, and 3MF, which I'm actually going to speak about next. Uh, so do not forget to edit and flip your normals when you're working with those. And uh, some other things you'll need to account for are the settings you'll be inputting into the USDZ export window, which you can see an example of on the right side of the slide. Typically, the higher you set your DPI, the better details like logos or paint textures will appear in your final AR export. But be aware that higher DPI directly contributes to larger file sizes. And uh, generally, you'll, you'll want to keep file sizes as small as possible, aiming for 70 megabytes to be about the largest file size you export. Uh, however, even 70 megabytes on older phones uh, may struggle to open AR files due to the lack of processing power. On the other hand, uh, larger sample counts will generally not increase file size, but will greatly improve your material's reflectivity and brightness. Uh, and Keyshot's default value for all exports is 16 samples, but you can safely double the sample count uh, for USDCs without encountering any issues. So that's awesome. Now, I have mentioned GLB, GLTF exports several times through the presentation, but I haven't spent too much time talking about them specifically. Um, as I mentioned earlier, GLB, GLTF is essentially Android's version of an AR export and will work across Android devices that are Android 7.0 and above. In Keyshot 10, we updated this export to improve UV unwrapping and baking during export. And in 10.2, we've once again updated the feature. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, GLB, GLTF can now be imported into Keyshot and has also received the same import updates uh, regarding materials that we've applied to USDZ files. But aside from that, it has also received an update that allows users to export with Draco compression. And for those of you not familiar with Draco compression, it's simply a GLTF extension that allows you to compress and decompress 3D meshes. Um, this is important to consider because it significantly reduces your exported file size, which is uh, it's almost necessary since GLB, GLTF files, uh, they typically export larger than USDZ files, even if they have identical settings. So that's, that's something that uh, uh, is super helpful and I encourage you to use. So on this slide, I've included some examples of AR exports I made this past week using Keyshot. All these were done using USDZ because I myself am an iPhone user, but we did also test them using GLB, GLTF on an Android phone as well. Uh, I chose these four examples because I feel like they show off a pretty wide range of products that you might want to use an AR export to view. But I also wanted to bring attention to the quality of each of these so you have an idea of what to expect based on your settings. Uh, if you notice, the, the game controller, the toy train, and the vehicle seem to lack some of the material qualities that would be present in Keyshot, particularly the vehicle. Uh, uh, most notably, they seem slightly flat. Uh, instead of the glossy finish you'd expect to see on something like a vehicle paint or a glossy plastic. And this is mainly because I exported these without changing the default sample settings, and I set the DPI to a lower than default number. And that was for the sake of trying to see how fast I could export these. And if you look at the helmet, on the other hand, it seems to retain more of its glossy finish, and even the foam texture on the interior comes through a little bit better than other images on this page. And that's because the samples were set to 32, which I mentioned in the last slide, and the DPI was left at the default of 200. Now, I, I did want to bring attention back to the vehicle specifically. Although the colors do appear flat, this actually serves as a great use case for our new mesh simplification tool. Originally, I tried exporting that file at full size with high DPI and samples and was unable to get that file size small enough 
for it to successfully open on my mobile phone. Uh, so my solution was to drastically reduce the model's triangle count, making it very low poly. And then as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I was able to use the edit normals tool to make the model appear much higher quality than its triangle count would imply. And I think it did a pretty good job considering it has a very low poly model. And then from that point, I was able to export and open the USDZ without issue and was able to preview my model in real time. And obviously there are limitations to where in the development process this could be used, but it makes for an incredible tool when you're trying to discuss and communicate design intent or specific details with remote development partners. Uh, you know, it, it also creates a fantastic platform for remote teams to start discussions about CMF and colorways when they're entering that phase of design. And lastly, on the subject of our AR exports, I wanted to bring attention to our export menu that you can see on this slide. In 10.2, we've also introduced the brand new export to AR option at the bottom of the menu. And this allows you to export both USDZ and GLB files simultaneously. And with this export, just like the GLB GLTF export window, you also have the option to set Draco compression for your soon to be exported GLB file. And uh, here, as a quick side note, I did wanted to uh, I wanted to plug the the Envoy webpage again. Uh, as I mentioned near the beginning of the presentation, you can take a look at the site by visiting www.keyshot.com/envoy. Here you'll find our entire project from start to finish. And you'll also be able to download the Helmet AR file you just saw in the last slide by scanning that QR code you see on the screen. And if you are visiting from a mobile device, I believe that QR code is just a download link that will automatically, uh, you know, work for iPhone or Android devices, depending on which one you're using. So I highly encourage you guys checking that out. All right, okay, now for the subject that I'm sure all of you have been on the edge of your seat for, let's dive into 3MF exports and full color printing. So hands down, 3MF is one of my favorite features in Keyshot because one of my favorite aspects of the design process is prototyping. And now with Keyshot's 3MF export, prototyping highly realistic and accurate models has never been easier. So what exactly is 3MF? Well, for those of you who are not aware, 3MF is actually an abbreviation for 3D manufacturing format, which was designed by an industry consortium in an attempt to create a full fidelity printing format. Uh, 3MF's goal was basically to replace older formats such as STLs, and it allows for design applications to send full fidelity models to a mix of applications, platforms, services, and printers, such as the J55, which you can see pictured on the right side of the slide. Uh, this in turn lets design teams much like yours focus on innovating and prototyping in-house. Now, the real magic of 3MF in context to the design environment is that it essentially lets you print exactly what you can see on your Keyshot screen. Uh, by being able to export textures, colors, different materials, and mesh geometry, 3MF basically creates a means to go from render to prototype in less than 24 hours, particularly when using machines like the J55, which are small enough to keep in your average office environment. And if you actually check out the images to the right, you can see some full color 3D prints that we've done on our own in-house J55. Uh, the only finishing that's been done to these is adding clear coat and they've provided just an incredible look at what one of our final colorway options might look like in the physical world. Now, these examples, they were printed at a smaller scale, but the only limitation to print size that you actually have pertains to your printer's tray size or the amount of material you wanna use. We chose a smaller model to save material since we had multiple colorways we were looking at during that stage of the design process. Nonetheless, you can clearly see that the print was able to produce accurate and visible branding. It maintained accuracy of the speckled finish, even at this small scale, and was even able to successfully print parts of the model that were intended to be clear or translucent. Overall, it's just an incredibly powerful tool that I highly recommend you taking advantage of, particularly if you're trying to avoid high prototyping costs or long turnaround times. And I did wanna mention that the actual helmet body with the lights and the clear portions in the back, even the foam on the interior, that was all printed in one piece, not multiple pieces and glued together. So it's, it's just absolutely incredible. I also have some general model prep tips for you guys when you're trying to optimize your models from 3D printing. 
Uh, these are just a few useful tips, but I do recommend checking out our online 3MF resources on our YouTube channel and also keeping on the lookout for our upcoming 3MF tutorial where I'll cover all the ins and outs of printing with 3MF. Obviously, one of the most important things to consider when prepping prints is making sure you're applying materials that are supported for printing. Uh, these, these might differ slightly from printer to printer, but generally these tips are, are somewhat universal. Um, I've also included a list on this slide that you can screenshot for future reference. Uh, so you at least have a baseline of where to start in regard to supported materials. Another incredibly important element to the prep process is making sure that your models to be printed are exported at proper scale. Ideally, you wanna make sure that the part or product was modeled at the correct scale so that it translates easily to the final print. Uh, it's also important to double check that scale when being exported out of Keyshot because incorrectly scale models, they don't only translate to inaccurate prints, but if the scale of your export is much larger than expected, uh, you may have issues exporting your model successfully, which you don't want. And you can always confirm your, your object scale at the top of the 3MF export window, and you can make adjustments accordingly. Uh, something you should also consider, particularly if you're using custom textures or logos, is setting your DPI, just the same way that we kind of did here with our logos. Uh, a general rule of thumb is that DPI should be set between 400 to 600, but I would highly recommend setting your DPI at the high end of that scale, if possible, to achieve the best results for your printed textures and graphics. And uh, let's, let's also briefly talk about some geometry-related issues when printing, uh, because they can sometimes be a little tricky spot and it's good to keep them in the back of your head during the prep process. Uh, to start, uh, proper tessellation should be self-explanatory. Uh, low poly models will print low poly and high poly models will print high poly. However, sometimes it's easy to overlook the model's tessellation since Keyshot does such a great job making low poly models appear more accurate. Uh, as a general rule for this uh, would be to, to make sure that the model is exported as a high poly object from your CAD software to begin with, uh, but it's, it's always a great idea to double check your tessellation in Keyshot, you know, just in case something might need a little TLC before exporting. And the last prep tip I'll touch on for this slide is making sure to allow for looser tolerances if you're going to be printing surface textures from Keyshot. Uh, the issue with tight tolerances is that any overlap inevitably fuses parts together. It's definitely something uh, you don't want. Uh, for instance, think about a box of some type with a hinged lid. Let's say I wanted to print the product in one piece and I wanted to add some sort of um, you know, mold tech material on the lid or I displace some type of stippled texture on its surface. If I'm uh, working with tight tolerances, the newly added surface texture of the lid might actually increase its dimensions and decrease the tolerance between the lid and the box, leading to an intersection. And this would inevitably cause the parts to intersect, to fuse, and would prevent them from being able to open when you have a finished part. And because of that, it's just a general best practice to leave a little bit looser tolerance on parts you know that you'll be adding textures to in Keyshot. It just makes for a, a simpler workflow. And I, I just wanted to shout out the awesome folks at Stratasys, particularly Colton, who'll be taking over in a moment for getting these, those Envoy helmets printed that you see on the right here. Uh, that image serves as a nice little example of how you can use these tips to experiment with colorways quickly and accurately using small scale 3MF prints. And of course, an incredibly useful tool when 3MF printing is the ability is to be able to not only print colors and textures, but also clear materials. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this subject since I know Colton will be touching on it briefly as well, but it's important to work with certain transparent or translucent uh, materials that have a track record of delivering reliable results. On the screen here, you can see a list of materials that will work best for achieving clear material. All these will generally deliver the most optimal results. However, they will need, likely need a little bit of finishing uh, after printing to make them perfect. Um, and it's also good practice to make sure your color hex number is set to the purest white for best results. You will also need to assign a clear material in your slicing software, uh, but this would be the ideal settings to export from Keyshot. And you can also print cloudy and transparent plastics as well that can be colorized by adjusting the specular transmission, which will let you achieve a number of different colorized effects. 
And again, these are just a few helpful tips and tricks and you know, for, for successfully prototyping with 3MF out of Keyshot. There are plenty more and lots of nuances that I'll be covering in that upcoming tutorial I mentioned in the previous slide. I highly recommend keeping on the lookout for it. And in the meantime, use both Stratasys and Keyshot's resources to jumpstart your 3MF printing workflows. And on that note, I'll pass it over to Colton Meloff over at Stratasys to give you guys a peek at some of the incredible work they're doing for the world of prototyping and 3D printing. Take it away, Colton. Excellent. Thanks, Kareem. I uh, was on the last page there. But thanks for having me. Uh, we're excited to be joining you today. Uh, my name is Colton. I'm an applications engineer on PolyJet. So PolyJet being the liquid polymer 3D printing, full color plus clear hyper realism models. Um, we're going to be talking more about printing with 3MF and really what's possible. And then, as Green mentioned, we'll kick off that design competition, which kind of be the call to action of, of how you can get involved, how you can get some free prints. Uh, Stratus is a worldwide company. We have uh, four different manufacturing locations. We operate in 13 countries, um, countless resellers around the world are our, our partners, um, over 2,000 employees. And we're ramping up in the number of technologies as well. So we have uh, FDM and PolyJet are really core technologies that we started with FDM being founded by Stratasys 32, 33 years ago, uh, merging with Object who invented PolyJet 3D printing. Uh, and then, and that was our technologies for quite a while. Uh, MakerBot brought FFF. And then we recently, as in this year, added stereolithography, DLP, and SAF to our portfolio. So we're only talking about PolyJet today, but Stratasys really has a wide range of offerings. So how does PolyJet work, right? How do we make these models? We're starting with a liquid resin and it jets out of uh, uh, print heads. And for each different material you have in the print head, there's 192 nozzles. These nozzles are tiny, smaller than human hair, uses a little piezo to squirt out a small bit of resin as that print head moves across your part, as it moves across the part uh, uh, between each layer, the tray actually moves down and a UV lamp is curing the part from a liquid to a solid. It's a one-way chemical reaction uh, that is sped up by a UV light uh, and there's no going back. The material does not melt or, or uh, you know, go back to a uh, glassiest or liquid state again. So this is a blown up picture of, let's say one layer of a part. Uh, and, and this layer you can see each of those pixels is either cyan, magenta, yellow, black, white, clear, uh, or some of our other materials like rubber, like or digital APS. And it's specifying what material gets dropped in that spot. Seems really hard, but really GrabCAD Print is gonna take care of all that work. So here is a uh, video of one of our larger printers is a J850 printing. You can see as a print block moves left and right, and it's just one piece re repeated. So between each of these, and then move forwards and print the next path is printing about two or three inches wide at a time. So because it's printing a large surface area at a time, that means it can print a very thin layer at a time and keep up the same overall print speed. So prints about the same speed as other technologies like FDM, um, but the layer resolution can get down to 14 microns or half the width of one of your hairs. So you have very small layer lines. There's a couple options right now uh, for printing with PolyJet. Got the J55, which is small, office friendly, uh, lower price point, prints with a churning tray, which gives it that small footprint with a large print area. Then there's J850, that was in the last video, larger print area. Then there's also Stratasys uh, Direct Manufacturing, which is great for designers who need a variable throughput um, and want to send their files off be printed and sent back to them. So we show that complicated picture of all the drops being laid down for a part. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, what you do is take that 3MF file, the uh, cream was showing us how to export, drag that into GrabCAD Print. In GrabCAD Print, we can pick the orientation, we can change some colors per body if we need to do that. And then we click print and it comes out of our printer. And that picture on the right is actually the printed part. Um, I took that picture with a Canon uh, M50 uh, just in the studio I'm sitting in right now. So, uh, you know, no, no uh, black box there. Really what PolyJet can do is unrealistic uh, compared to technology we've had previously. This is a 3D printed piece of pizza. I took a picture with some pepper and cheese on it. If you add a little bit of 
real to the 3D printed part. It really makes the, the part come to life. Here's another example of some beer bottles. The uh, bottles are printed with the liquid inside so that that tinted uh, material inside is printed with it. And then afterwards, we'll sand, clear coat it. Um, the glass with the actual beer on the right with the froth of the, the head, that is not printed. But uh, you know, adding that real part makes the 3D printed parts look less 3D printed. They really come to life. Here's a recent collaboration we're doing around packaging with Kinetic Vision. Uh, over the next couple of months, we're releasing many software updates or many software features in the next uh, updates that will allow you to do uh, uh, better translucency. So you can design a translucent part in Keyshot, bring that into GrabCAD print, and then it will print out with the translucency, that translucent color that you are aiming for. Um, and then also labels, text, better sharpness, all that kind of things coming with these packaging releases. And then also we can do rubber like, and then also, uh, which would be those handles on the right, and then progressing through your design cycle. So on the bottom picture, we have draft gray, which is economical, it prints faster, and then move up to maybe a, a two color print, and then add in some more color, and then go to full graphics, wood, leather, with the last print to bring in that uh, next level of realism and get all your stakeholders on board. So why? Why would we go to 3D printing if we can you know, see it on the screen with Keyshot's amazing render software. Well, the idea is to prototype using color sooner in your design process so that you can get that feedback in hand from all of your stakeholders. Here's a few tricks to working uh, with Keyshot, exporting to 3MF and then printing. Number one is start with a closed mesh. So that mesh on the left is not closed. We can close it using tools in Keyshot but better uh, is just to start with a file that is closed. Coming from SOLIDWORKS, pretty easy to do as long as you're working with bodies or if you're working with surfaces in a program like SOLIDWORKS, knit those surfaces together first. And then Kareem mentioned using the auto line normals. So that will flip all your normals so they're facing outwards. And then when you do need to apply a different material to sections on a body, use the split surfaces tool. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that paint uh, selection tool. That's going to be a great improvement. I have a couple resources on the bottom. One is the uh, best practices for working in Keyshot and GrabCAD Print, and that is on our GrabCAD Print uh, uh, tutorials page. If you just search for that, it'll come up. Um, and, and that has a, all the tips that Kareem mentioned, these ones, and then a lot more to think about, about what materials you're using, et cetera. One option you have going into GrabCAD is printing in gloss versus matte. And I think that one takes uh, or is worth a minute to explain. Matte is going to put support on all areas of the part. So you're going to get a uniform surface finish. When we print a polyjet, it needs support to be built on the bottom of the part. So it holds up this liquid resin as it is printing. It's kind of like a jello type material uh, or consistency. So after the part's done printing, we can just tear it away or blow it off with a pressure washer. And then we have glossy, which is going to give you better colors, better translucency without needing to use clear coat on the top surfaces. But it still needs support material on the bottom surfaces. So if you're going to post process your parts, matte is better. You can post process it evenly. If you're not going to, then gloss is better because at least half of your part looks really nice and shiny. And you can kind of orient uh, the part, the, the, the side of it you're going to take pictures of or the side of it that matters most orient that side up when printing, and that way that side's gonna turn out glossy. We have a new design competition launching right now out on the GrabCAD website around packaging. So it is challenging you to how can you best use Keyshot to design your package for 3D printing. I have a video to show you from our last uh, Keyshot competition around uh, gaming mice. I just wanna show you the result of that competition here. Oh, wow. Holy cow. This is amazing. This is way beyond what I was thinking. Holy cow. I mean, you show this to a client and they will get your design intent a hundred percent. You would expect a client to say, okay, I'm ready to, to put it in a box and start selling it. This, this, that's how convincing this is. It's absolutely amazing. So that was a winner of the uh, Mount Keyshot Mouse Design Competition. In advance to our next slide here. So let me, there we go. So for this design competition around packaging, 
Uh, we're going to give you a starter file so that we get uh, the, the water type models. So you can start with either a torus, a twist bottle, or a, a sphere. And then from there, you can add on some displacement, maybe add on some knurling on the cap so it's easier to open, add on some displacement around the text so the text kind of pops off. And then in Keyshot, add your branding. And from this competition, you could win Keyshot licensing, a printed model of your design. The winners, all finalists, actually, all the 10 finalists will print the models and will send those to you, just like uh, John, the video you just saw. So it's not just the winner that gets the, the 3D print of their model. And then also Stratus's direct manufacturing vouchers so that you can take your next project and use 3D printing uh, in that project. We'll pay for that. So to find out more about this, go to grabcad.com slash challenges. It opens up today and you have 32 days in order to complete the challenge and upload your submissions. Um, and finally, I'm going to stop sharing here. Stop sharing here. And I have my video going. I'm hoping you guys can see that. And I just want to show uh, that to uh, my left, we have the J55 printer. It is actually printing those helmets that Green was talking about, the smaller versions so that we can see uh, with the different color profiles and make a decision based on the colors. So these are actually uh, the 3D prints that are going on on that printer. These have no post-processing because they're printed in glosses so on the top side to look good. And then we also have uh, a bigger size model that was printed on the J850. This one has some clear coat on the outside. Um, but yeah, bring in the models from Keyshot from the screen into your hands. I want to open it up now for any questions for myself, for Kareem, for Derek, um, that anything that we can answer for you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Colton and Kareem, for that great presentation. Uh, we have a number of questions. Some of them I'm going to just point out that are too technical for me. So I'm glad you're here, Colton. We'll start with the most complicated one first. <laughs> um, someone's asking, what are the tolerances for H8, H8 fit when talking about surface finish? Can it go as low as RA 1.6? It's a great question. It's not the one. I, it's not a question that I know uh, to to give you an answer off my head. I'm not familiar with that scale. Okay. Um, but going on surface finish, you're usually then if that's something that's important to you, you're going to be sanding and then clear coat the model afterwards, or sand and then buff and polish, and that's going to give you a nice fine surface finish. There is a, a wine bottle that we designed recently. And I had people picking it up thinking it was a wine bottle and it felt like glass, felt like blown glass, uh, a wine bottle. So you can get really nice surface finishes, but depending on what your requirements are, it might require some sanding and polishing. Okay. And that was one of the questions folks had as well was on those helmets, if you're polishing those after printing or if that's just kind of how they're coming out of the machine. Absolutely. So these helmets, right, printed glossy facing up. So these have some areas on them. Um, Let's see if I can get a focus on there. These have some areas on them that are a little bit uh, rougher because they had support on it. There's some some down facing angles it's going to build support on there. But overall, it looks nice and glossy because it did not print support on the top. It only printed support on the bottom. Um, this helmet was bigger. To print it faster, we actually printed upside down or print with less material. And then after it was done printing, um, I hit some of the areas with about, uh, I want to say, 300 grit sandpaper. Um, and then we used a, a clear coat on it and just two coats of a two part clear coat. And, and that's it. So this is maybe uh, 15 minutes of work. It doesn't look, uh, you know, it's not something we put in a, a trade show booth that would take a little bit more time. But for what we're going for here, 15 minutes of work goes a long way. So the amount of return you gain from post processing uh, is diminishing, but also the more time you put into it, the more realistic or the more shiny of, a, of an end product you're going to get. Awesome. Uh, and then one person was asking, I think you had sort of shown this on those really cool beer bottles, uh, yeah. but how to actually like print, like use the, the um, uh, um, transparency to print uh, water sure. uh, bottles or wa water bubbles? Water bubbles. So we're just kind of uh, like, yeah, like, uh, on the surface, kind of like sh showing condensation or water droplets. Absolutely. So the, the water droplets, I meant to mention this when that picture was up. The water droplets were, were real droplets uh, put onto the bottle. So during photography, they actually uh, you know, 
take a glass glass that poured an actual beer into it next to a 3D printed parts, and they they made that model look a little wet. So there are some you know photography tricks that uh, are used in the non 3D printed world that we would take advantage of in this case as well. So as water drops were were water. Okay, great. And then can you give us a sense uh, on the small helmet versus the large helmet, what the uh, general print time was? Absolutely. So uh, these five print helmets, um, I want to say were about four hours um, and they were printed in the inside of the tray. Now in this print here, um, I printed them on the outside of the tray and it spins a little bit faster when printed on the outside of the tray. Um, you could fill the whole thing solid. It's just however far out you go, it's going to turn a little slower. Um, these ones, I have 10 helmets printing and, you know, each one is about uh, two inches tall. And these are, are going to take about 11 and a half hours to build. And I put them on the outside so you can kind of see them going by better. So about 11 and a half hours for these 10 helmets. Um, but the idea is as long as you're staying under whatever overnight is, you know, from when you leave the office at 5 p.m. to when you come in at 8 a.m., uh, if you're going for a concept that doesn't need to be the same scale, but it needs just be in your hands, that's usually what we scale things down to is to print in those lights off hours while it's, it's no man hours or your, your printer is doing all that work without you. Great. And you were showing kind of how you would print like clay and then maybe like multicolor and then, you know, really kind of blow it out sort of as you go through the design process. Yep. Um, can you do that in, in one print? In other words, could I have, for example, just sort of the gray... Absolutely. On the tray and then for one and be doing the full color for, for a different um, design yeah absolutely so with that picture specifically the first one would have been printed in draft gray which is a more economical material uh, and then also would have been printed in a, in a higher speed in one of our larger printers and in that one you can print um, a soda a plastic soda bottle standard size in four hours which is really fast for that material um, now coming down into the J55 or when you have full color loaded, you could print something gray, right? And it's gonna composite that material or composite that color using the different colors or different, uh, you know, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, white. And then you could also print something else that is full color in a different way and something else that is a single color, something else that is clear. So absolutely, you can, among your whole tray, you can mix what you're doing uh, on that tray. In our larger printers, you could even print something that is rubber-like and then something else that is hard and then something else that is rubber and hard in different parts of the same assembly. Okay. And then in terms of some folks are asking you sort of have really complex geometry, uh, how you prep that and sort of what the role of the GrabCAD print is and making sure that the more complex geometry is going to print correctly. Absolutely. So in GrabCAD print, there are some tools uh, to automatically align your part, and it's going to align it for whatever will print fastest. So Z is the slowest dimension for printing, so it's going to shallow in Z, shallow in Y. But on J55, you know, you're printing a round tray, so it's just a little more kind of like an algorithm, so it will uh, align it print fastest. But you can also think about um, round things are going to print more round if they are facing vertically. Uh, right, so we have some best practice guides on there to kind of think about. Um, let's say you have some some small features that are coming vertically and they don't need support. If they're printed vertically without support, then those surface walls get a little stronger. So there's some some best practices you can tie in there. Um, if you have questions about that, uh, we have a Polyjet design for additive manufacturing best practice, and that goes through all of those sorts of details. Wonderful. Well, we're near the top of the hour here, so I'll ask you one last question. You showed kind of the whole suite of printers. If people want a, 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 a metal-like um, print, what is there any options available to them for that? Absolutely. So uh, there's two, two ways to, to think of that question. One is, do you want to look like metal? And in that case, in Polyjet, you can simulate uh, metal appearances. And you need to do it with a diffuse map on the outside that has the right shadows built in. I didn't have it in this presentation, but uh, I will have a tutorial out on it shortly. Uh, that shows one that it does not have this built in, one that does have this diffuse map, and one looks like it has the shadows of aluminum. So it looks like metal, as long as your scene is right, right? Because you're, you're printing with whatever simulated scene you have on your screen. So then when you go into the real world and look at it, you need your light source to become from relatively the right direction in order for it to look right. Um, the other way to answer that question is, can you 3D print metal? And the answer is yes. So our uh, parts on demand service, Stratasys Direct Manufacturing, they have printers that can 3D print metal. 
Um, we do not sell the printers to do that, but we have the capabilities in-house to 3D print your designs in metal and then ship those to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You and Kareem definitely delivered as a dream team. Fantastic job. Uh, reminder, yeah, you can sort of see some of the imagery that we showed there on that Envoy page. So you can actually sort of see what those 3D prints look like. Uh, I'm going to take the screen from you here, uh, Colton, so I can sort of share for folks just what's coming up next. So uh, reminder for uh, today, we have um, a couple of different, um, let me go ahead and play that. Um, we have uh, obviously the session you just saw, which was fantastic. Thank you guys for that. Uh, at noon, we'll be coming back with key, uh, key shot for ZBrush. So uh, Michael Pavlovich from Certain Affinity will be talking about how he uses um, Keyshot with ZBrush in game design and character design. And then we're wrapping up Keyshot World 2021 Virtual Edition uh, at 2 p.m. today. Uh, again, leveraging uh, those uh, Keyshot, those eye-catching product shots. Uh, and do not forget the wonderful folks of NVIDIA have given us an A6000 GP to give away. Uh, so that will be given away at 2 p.m. today. Uh, attending any of the sessions enters you into that. Um, so again, thank you, everyone. Any parting words for us, uh, Colton? No, I just want to say thank you for having me, Derek. And uh, be sure to go out and look at the design challenge and uh, submit your files. Yes, great. Thank you yeah, for reminding me. Yes, please. Uh, if you're really curious about 3D print, entering those contests is the best way to really learn more uh, and get involved. And so I, we, as you've seen, this is definitely some really exciting technology. Uh, so again, thank you guys for joining us today, and we will see you all shortly uh, in about uh, an hour.